generous amount of time. Um, how much uh, time do we have, Mary? Pardon? How much time? About half an hour to 35 minutes okay. uh, would be my guess. Okay. Unless you have a hard stop for some reason and need, do you need to stop before then? No, 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 no. I just wanted to be sure that, you know, we don't start talking too much. Oh, I, impossible. <laughs> 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 but you probably see the little box now in the corner that says that we're live streaming on YouTube now. So, um, oh, okay. and I'm just going to watch the clock now because I think it's just a, a matter of seconds probably before um, it hits 9 a.m. All right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the morning show. So happy to have you watching us this morning. We're coming to you on Channel 9, and we're also broadcasting on our radio station, WJOPLP Newburyport, FM 96.3. We're also live streaming on Newburyport Community Media's YouTube channel at ncmhub.org. I'm your host, Mary Jacobson, and I'm just really delighted to have my guest today. We have Deborah Curtin, who is, I'm sorry, yes, Curtin, the um, founder and president of the New England Primate Conservancy. And she's a return visitor to the morning show. I was happy to have her here about a year ago uh, to talk about the organization's overarching mission of primate and habitat conservation. And I'm so happy to welcome her back. And also here today, we have Laura Barr. She's an author, a filmmaker, and a writer, and she's an educational content creator for the New England Primate Conservancy. So they're here today to talk about some imaginative new educational initiatives they developed to engage upcoming generations in starting to learn while still young, how to conserve the planet that they're, we hope, going to inherit in a healthy condition one day. And they've also been challenged with adapting their lessons to the pandemic inspired need that students and teachers have for engaging in interesting distance learning. So first off, let me just welcome you both. Deborah, welcome, and thank you so much for visiting the morning show. Good to have you here. Thanks for having us here again, Mary. It's so good to see you. My pleasure. Good to see you. And Laura, welcome, and so nice to meet you, and thank you for taking time to come visit the morning show. Thank you. I'm super happy to be here. My pleasure. Well, uh, Deborah, I was hoping that you might start us off just by reminding us of the basic mission of the New England Primate Conservancy. Tell us about the measures that you advocate for and why these are critical, not just for preserving animals and their habitats, but for all of us and our ailing planet. Sure, um, New England Primate Conservancy's mission is to leave a legacy of hope and tools to build a better tomorrow for all the Earth citizens. Now you know us and you know that to us, the Earth citizens aren't just human. So we're talking about all the creatures of the earth. And we're an animal protection and wildlife conservation organization and we make our greatest impact through humane education. Now, as you probably know, the earth is losing species at an alarming rate. 70% of non-human primates are threatened by extinction. 100% of non-human primates are threatened by human activities. Primates are an indicator species. We've talked about this before. They're an indicator species of their habitat, of the health of their habitat. If they're at risk, every other species is at risk. Now it's we, the humans, who take land and we reassign it for human housing, for agriculture, for other forms of human consumption. And those lovely animals with whom we share the planet lose their habitats. As they lose habitat, we lose biodiversity. Biodiversity is mother nature's recipe for success. Every, every environment has the right number and the right species to nurture the environment and to nurture the species that live in it. It's not arbitrary. So when we come in and say, I want this forest for timber, I want this forest for cattle ranching, I want this forest for oil palm plantations, we, we throw off the balance of nature. Now, what we forget is, as we determine that these forests are no longer important, what we forget is that the rainforests especially are the Earth's lungs. And without them, we lose oxygen. 
So as you mentioned, we've spent this year especially realigning our projects. Once the pandemic came, we realigned our goals for the year and said, okay, what are we gonna to do to help the teachers, to help the kids, to change the lessons, the, the model that we had for our lessons so that it's easier for teachers to teach, easier for kids to learn. And if the parents need to get involved in the mix, easier for the parents to help them because let's not forget that parents are not professional educators. So they struggle, you know, and so we're trying to make it easy. And most importantly, while we're teaching, we wanna make it fun. So we're, yes. taking, we're, <laughs> taking these, we're taking these very important scientific notions. And as you also know, it was very important to us that we bring information to people in everyday language. We don't want to make it complicated. We don't wanna speak science to people. We wanna make it so that it's accessible to everybody. So we've redeveloped these lessons and created new lessons. And we'll, we'll talk about that more um, so that everyone can enjoy, and especially again in this hybrid situation. So we were so fortunate early in the year to meet Laura. She found us, <laughs> she found us, and she has such amazing skills, such a creative woman, so exciting to work with. And it's been my pleasure to be working with her. What, Laura, for the past, I don't know, since March, maybe? March, yeah. And so Laura has been our blessing in changing things as we've hoped to change them. Well, you know, let's meet Laura then and, and learn more about how you, Laura, engage. But but before we do that, yes. thank you for that um, that excellent summary, Deborah. The statistics that you gave uh, are, are very sobering um, and they uh, establish clearly how critical these issues are for all of us. And I love the way that you um, you frame the balance that evolves in nature. It's not just about human beings. Our health is dependent upon the balance that all these different species, uh, plants and animals have evolved together uh, to develop a sustainable ecosystem. And as human beings, I think too often we prioritize our own needs and we forget that we need to be in balance with all these other creatures and that it's dangerous when we muck about <laughs> with one part of it without holding on to the vision of the whole because there's truth and beauty in the vision of the whole. And yet you also state uh, beautifully the uh, challenges for educators who care about this um, with both the um, COVID restrictions and the needs of students, teachers and their poor parents, my goodness, yes, who now have had to become uh, teachers as well for months on end, much longer than I think everybody uh, had anticipated. And, um, and so you also talk eloquently about your uh, fortunate convergence with a, a talented um, educational content creator, Laura. And so Laura, I'd love to learn more about how did you find the conservancy and what got you interested in working with Deborah on these educational initiatives? So I, I can say that the blessing has definitely been mutual. I went through um, a period of, for the past two years, I've been feeling uh, this kind of overwhelming sense of despair about the lack of awareness about what's happening to different species, this kind of feeling of great poverty, uh, the lack of animal diversity in our immediate environment. And um, it sort of came to a climax this year with feeling this, with all the fires and things like that, making it really actually hard for me to get out of bed, honestly. Uh, Just yeah. this feeling of like, what can I possibly do? nobody really cares and nobody can really do anything about this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, Joel uh, Sator, the um, photographer for National Geographic had this beautiful, has this beautiful book called Vanishing from his photo work and all of these animals that are endangered. Mm -hmm. And uh, within that book, he makes this call and he says, I'm doing all I can, will you join me? And that was sort of this moment where I was like, I can do something. I can't do it all, but I can do something. I don't know what I can do, but I do know that when you want to do something, you see who else is doing something. 
And then if you join them, now you're doing more because you're pooling your efforts. So my first idea was, I'm just gonna look at each of these pictures and I'm going to see who's doing something for these animals. So uh, on the back cover is the gray woolly monkey. And I, so I looked at the gray woolly monkey and I was like, who is doing something for this, this animal? And I stumbled across this beautiful profile of the, of the gray woolly monkey. And it was the New England Primate Conservancy. And I was like, they have a Primate Conservancy here in New England? This is, and I was looking around at this site, this beautiful site, and then it had a call for volunteers. I was like, uh, they want a volunteer? <laughs> well, and they wanted a volunteer who was a writer, which uh, I'm a writer, I'm trained as a journalist, I've written novels and short stories. And uh, so I, I was, I was compelled, I sent, uh, <laughs> I sent my resume, I kept, <laughs> have you seen my resume yet? Have you seen my resume yet? I really want to volunteer, can I volunteer? <laughs> I'm a really hard worker, I work really hard, can I <laughs> please let me do something? <laughs> and uh, after I spoke with Deborah, it was just, the feeling of being able to do anything at all was just such a relief. Um, and so I started um, writing primate profiles for the Conservancy which is just a awesome, an awesome job as both a journalist and as a creative writer to be able to look at all the scientific information and cull it down to um, very specific, uh, very specific categories, but still keeping your own voice within it so that it's accessible to all readers. And then when all of the schools closed down, um, Deborah sent out something to all of her volunteers asking for content creation. Uh, for education. Oh, okay. And um, so I have been, I've been a teacher at a private school um, in Los Angeles for, for 12 years. And I moved out to uh, Brockton, Massachusetts. And I, you know, I sub in the Brockton schools, but I was kind of like, you know, I, I don't know about going back to the classroom, but I do know a lot about creating differentiated content to, to um, a wide variety of learners. So uh, I was like, I can do this. This is something I can do. And so from there, we, we developed this content. Um, called That's this. a great story. It sounds like a real convergence of you looking for something uh, that would enable you to feel as though, yes, I can do something. I don't have to just rest in feeling overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, and Deborah does have a beautiful website. I've seen those pictures of those animals and they are totally seductive <laughs> and beautiful mm -hmm. and just make you care. And it sounds as though it had that emotional impact on you, Laura. And it sounds as though your background then was perfectly paired with what um, Deborah and the Conservancy needed. So that's a, that, that in itself is an inspiring story <laughs> that you have these synergies yeah. out there and you have to sometimes just kind of keep looking and stumble into them and then they'll create a way that can carry you forward. Uh, yeah. So thank you for that story. Well, well the next question I, I wanted to talk about was um, what makes it so important to create these engaging uh, educational lesson plans for children? Um, why is it so important that we create um, compelling education on these conservation issues and habitat preservation issues for children? What's at stake for us? Well, children are going to inherit the planet. You know, this is, this is what they are going, they're being given all of the things that their um, ancestors and that their parents and their parents' parents, the things that we have put in place are the, the things, the issues that they're inheriting. So everything from pollution to climate change to, for me, the, the you know, the loss of species and biodiversity, um, that's, that's going to be what they get. Um, so they are the people who are the most directly impacted by what's happening. This is the world that they're going to be left with. So, I mean, really, you know, if you look like who, who's the victim besides the animals <laughs> or all of us <laughs> who inhabit this planet, um, the, the children really, and this really is a, let's think about the children <laughs> sort of yeah. Um, issue. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I know that um, one of your ways to engage children um, in active project-based learning about these issues uh, has been to pose some of the challenges and problems as mysteries. 
And who doesn't like a good mystery? Who doesn't get engaged by trying to solve the mystery? Um, child or adult, we love a mystery. Um, as I remember as a character in an Ian Forster novel once said, I hate muddles, but I love mysteries. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you transform them from muddles into mysteries and then you can work on solving them. So how did you get the idea to cast um, children as detectives and how do you engage them in sleuthing on these conservation issues? So I, I am a huge classic noir pre like Hayes Code classic noir fan. Like I love them. So this has been a, an obsession for at least the last 20 years. I don't know. Like I've been very obsessed with old school detective stories. Um, and so for me, the idea of being a detective allows you to have some distance, some skepticism, a sense of yourself as like cool. <laughs> yes. cool. And then, and, and I think that distance and coolness is important when you are particularly investigating something that is highly emotional and highly, you know, um, and, and very complicated, honestly. So if you look at, if you look at life as a mystery that you are investigating, you know, when there's an issue that you can, you can, have that sort of attitude toward it, it gives you a much more empowering sense of a, a purpose and of investigation. And then the other thing is there really, there really needs to be a sense of you do need to figure this out for yourself. Especially if you're, if, if you are trying to educate someone or you're a, a student, you need to figure it out. You shouldn't just rely on what other people you know, a pat answer, you need to have that critical thinking now more than ever, being able to evaluate things, look at them critically, being able to um, say, is this true? What's the bias of this? Why are they saying this? Who gets what out of this? That kind of attitude, we all need to start to think about our own critical thinking skills, but kids most in particular, because they're just being bombarded daily with so much information overload. So to be able to, to sift through and see where are the threads and how do they connect? So, so yeah, for, for me, I think approaching our world as detectives, like we are each our own detective is, is a good way of casting yourself and um, kids love it because it, it's a great way to view the world. <laughs> And, and I know that Deborah, so I, 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 approached Deborah and I was like, okay, so I'm thinking of doing like a classic kind of noir sort of mystery sort of thing. What do you think of that? Do you like that? I was worried she's going to be like, no, <laughs> just, just like, no, I love it. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of my old neighborhood. I remember going for a walk once and running into a group of, they must've been eight or nine year old girls and they all had magnifying glasses and they approached me and my dog and they said, Got any mysteries for us to solve? <laughs> and it felt so bad. <laughs> I, I went home and tried to think of one, but you're absolutely right. But you know what else I love about the way you're framing this, Laura, is um, that kind of in, intrinsic in the in the in the frame of mind of being a detective is an activist stance. Um, yeah. You know, something that invites your curiosity, but also your examination, uh, searching for clues. Uh, with the idea that you're empowered to, to do the quest. And I like the way you put it, that as individuals, we all need to become detectives about how to work on our world and find solutions to things. And then how do you add the, how do you follow the threads and, and kind of come up with answers, which is enormously satisfying <laughs> also. So that everything is fun about it, the quest, the stance, and also finding the answers. And that leads us to the next question that I wanted to uh, ask you, which is, tell us about the choice you made for uh, your first um, case of disappearing habitat, subtitled The Candy Culprit. And you know, of course you had my interest at candy because I'm a sugar freak. <laughs> <laughs> and you would have any child, if you didn't have them at mystery, <laughs> you're certainly gonna have them at candy culprit. <laughs> Well, there's something really engaged. I love words and culprit. It's just a good word. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, what connections then uh, do the detectives learn to make between candy and the case of the disappearing habitat? 
So I, I really have to credit Deborah, first of all, with oh. <laughs> helping me come de- come to candy because I started with, you know, for me, uh, I've worked really hard on my candy addiction through the years, <laughs> but I have I have all of my teeth are sweet, <laughs> but I, I have to really watch it. Or if I, if I'm left to my own devices, I'll just eat candy all day, every day. <laughs> so, um, but I was, I was looking at the, you know, what, what is something that would engage students that it's really important when you're designing a lesson to think, well, what is the outcome that you're trying to, to get? What is it that you're trying to get, lead the students to do? What's your deliverable, so to speak? And for me, I was looking at, well, what is, what am I asked to do on a daily basis by all the nonprofits that email me? And usually it's give money, but also it's usually like, um, can you write a letter to your congressperson? Will you uh, write a letter to this person? And so basically I'm asked a lot to write uh, letters, um, emails. And, And I was thinking about it and I thought, well, that's a great outcome for a student to get. How, how to make your voice heard to someone who is making decisions about things like Habitat. And then, so then the question was, well, what, what is really causing um, cl- uh, the, the loss of Habitat that is connected to what kids do in any way? Because we want those threads to meet. We don't want it to be, for me, I was talking about coffee because I drink coffee, an enormous amount of coffee. So I was like, well, I know coffee is problematic, um, but uh, but there's some, but not a lot of kids drink coffee. <laughs> and there's actually a much bigger culprit out there. And Deborah was like, candy is a really big problem in terms of, in particular, um, the use of palm oil and the habitat of um, orangutans. Um, and so then we worked together to really kind of refine, like to, to put those, the, the threads together for that. And um, so if you look at the educational resources that she's had, she has these beautiful um, primate uh, tiles and you can adopt a primate or a rainforest tile where you pick an animal from the rainforest. So looking at a rainforest animal and adopting them as a client is the first step, which I have to say is, the kids love this because when you adopt a, an animal as your own, like this is my client, it really um, puts that bond between you and it becomes a lot more personal. And so then, if I, and if I may, it's, this is not a financial adoption as you hear from so many nonprofits. This is just, you select your primate and, and you're adopting them as your client. There's no, it's just for the kids, strictly for the kids. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no, in fact, all of these lessons are completely free. That's the other thing about this. These are all available with, you know, there's no, um, there's no cost to, uh, to do this. You can just, you know, that's the thing about, it's a free educational resource. So, um, so the students adopt a, an animal from the rainforest and then they make the connection from that to, they start listing their favorite candies and they look at their favorite candies and then they investigate the ingredients of their candy, which is just a uh, a wonderfully edifying thing when you actually look at the ingredients of what's in the candy that you're consuming. A lot of the ingredients are um, can be disguised in terms of not knowing what they are. So then another step of this uh, of this project is investigating what these ingredients are if you don't know what they are. And in particular, if there's palm oil to flag it and palm oil derivatives. I didn't know that there was palm oil in Twizzlers. I thought it was only in chocolate, honestly. When, Deborah, you were the one who, like when we were doing the, the library uh, presentation, you were like, there's palm oil in Twizzlers. I was like, there's palm oil in Twizzlers? <laughs> there's palm yeah. oil so many things. If you so start looking for it, uh, ice cream cones, all, I mean, all kinds yes. of things. Yes. And, and so, so flagging that and looking at all of the different things that it's in and then looking at who produces the candy that you are consuming and then looking at their environmental scorecard. What are their sustainability practices and, and doing research into what is, uh, what has been said about their sustainability practices, what they say about their sustainability practices. Um, and then, and, and this is the part that's really doing critical research because students are being asked to evaluate their sources. They're being asked to 
look at what other people at a variety of sources. So not just what one person is saying, but what are other people saying about that same company? And then from there to make their own conclusion and to write to the company, the candy company, giving them either a favorable, you know, sweet candy gram saying, thank you. I so appreciate the work that you do. Uh, you know, I feel great about eating your candy, knowing that you are working towards, you know, protecting habitats or, you know, can you please do better? And, and, and the thing is, this isn't a vacuum. Um, this doesn't just happen and nothing happens. There are companies like Kellogg's that has pledged to stop using palm oil based on on kids continually um, writing the company, asking for them to change their practices. So these are these are things that make a difference. And what Laura has not oh, yes, excuse Sorry, me, ahead, what Laura has not mentioned is the amazing, absolutely amazing videos that she created to a company. There are five steps to each lesson, five five videos from six videos maybe with the introduction. And they're all in that noir style of sleuthing and being a detective. They're so much fun. They're brief videos. They're so much fun, but the kids so engage with them. It's wonderful. It's really wonderful. So I thank Laura all the time for those. They're, they're just sensational. Yay. <laughs> they are, yeah, they are sensational. Like there is a trailer that, that for everybody who wants to go to the New England Primate Conservancy website, and, and look for the heading for the case of the disappearing habitat, the candy culprit. And there is just a wonderful um, teaser, I guess I would call it, video um, in which, um, uh, well, Laura, I don't know, you, you said you had the hat there. You oh yeah, have I have the hat. When I, I, <laughs> I zoom with, the, I've been Zooming with kids in classrooms and they don't recognize me until I put the hat on. So I, I have the hat ready. <laughs> this is like from an old theater production. Like I, I, I've gotten more use out of this hat. <laughs> For those of you listening on the radio, Laura has this greatest kind of broad rim, um, uh, hat, old fashioned looking hat. And, um, and then the black and white video, it just looks like an old fashioned Sergeant Friday. I'm dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> but some of you will know who I mean when I say dum dum dum. <laughs> it's just super fun. And, and, uh, I just love the um, every step of the process where you're you're teaching children um, how to be detectives in the most productive and sustainable way because they're tracking the evidence, they're finding it, they're learning about their own buying habits, uh, uh, what it means to be a consumer, and you're also teaching them that we all have choices to make. We can buy one product or another. Um, and you're teaching them to check the ingredients on their label and to understand that these buying habits have consequences. If you can find something with palm oil that is ruining rainforest habitat for primates that we need for the delicate balance that you were talking about before, Deborah, you can learn about the, you learn what sustainability is. <laughs> you learn that there are sources on the internet where you can learn about corporate investment and whether they're good corporate citizens or, or, or not. And then, the out, and I love the outcome that you find that um, corporations are getting letters um, and actually responding to them. This is a triumph. <laughs> what a brilliant idea. I just love it. <laughs> so um, now I, I, I wondered, uh, in addition to writing letters, are there other action steps um, that you um, teach students um, are available to them as they gain their own uh, education here about their consuming habits? Um, yeah, and, and one of the things that, um, just to circle back on the videos, I do have to thank my, my partner, Ezra Orb, who oh, did, sure. he is, the reason the videos look so good is, is because of him, because I, I enlisted him and I was like, you, you got it, you got it, you got to do these for me. <laughs> and he, he yeah. shot them, he edited them, he put music on them, he does this, uh, he, he lit them, <laughs> he directed me. <laughs> he would be like, do, do it again, just do it again. <laughs> No one's going to understand that. Can I have a little more energy? <laughs> we all need somebody like that. <laughs> yeah, we do. So uh, he really, yeah, he really did a great job. He also, just for the film lovers around there, 
he put a filter on the videos that is an actual film filter. So it has the same kind of crackle and, and look of an old detective um, film because he put a filter on it that has an actual film grain. So if you're a film junkie like like I am, it's 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 very cool. Um, yeah. So, but but the other steps that are in the the video, the the things that um, students can do that it guides them to do um, are there, there's there's lots of them. And and one of the things I really wanted to make sure we did is embed in each video um, the the there's a lot of different trails that you could take in each video that'll take you to another destination in terms of like, if you spent a lot of time just investigating who produces what products, what that company does, what their whole company practice is. Um, if you just spend time investigating all of the different um, products that use palm oil and how do they get them? If you spend a lot of time just um, looking at what are the ingredients and why are ingredients why do certain products use those types of ingredients? So these are, these are all different um, things that you can do. But, but so besides just letters, there, um, we also really want kids to start talking about this and, and sharing this with each other, sharing this with their parents. So it's also, there's a, a lot of call to, to, to organize with other people and, um, and talk with other people and share what you know, um, because you could get this has happened to me countless times. I send a letter and I say, hey, I love this product. I notice it has palm oil. Um, can you tell me about where this palm oil is sourced and how? And, or if, you know, maybe you can use some other product instead of palm oil um, and I'll get something back that, you know, says, <laughs> thank you for your concern. But it doesn't sound like anybody read it or anything like that. So you can get discouraged pretty easily. But the other thing that the videos ask you to do is like, if you get that kind of response, then you, you keep going. You don't just give up. You don't say, well, they didn't listen to me at the end. Then you say, okay, I guess I got to write more letters. <laughs> I guess I got to talk to more people. I guess I got to, you know, do something else. But, but the idea is to make yourself into a, an empowered consumer. You have choices about what you buy. And if you're a kid, you know, your parents are the people making those choices, but you have influence over them about what they buy is particularly things for you. So, yeah. so also there, there are a number of different projects that kids can do besides the writing of the letters. And, and this enables them to engage with each other as well. So they might, from what they've learned, they might create a meme. It might be something like, you know, palm oil is a problem and with a picture of, the, of a primate that's impacted by it. And, and, you know, whatever the meme might say that they've learned or they might create a video or they might create a presentation. We, we give them a number of suggestions. Laura also um, added a PowerPoint video that they can follow, one that they can just fill in if they wanted to do that to, to um, share with their class but the memes can be shared on social media. Um, there, as I said, if they do a video, they can do that. You know, TikTok is, is huge. If they did a little TikTok thing, that's something that they could share with their friends. And what this further does, it enables the teachers to use these lessons across educational disciplines. Mm. So if the kids are learning media, they might make a film. If the kids are, are in an art class, they might do a poster board drawing. They might create a meme. Um, there are plenty of things in there that a math teacher could use because you're looking at ingredients and measurements and those sorts of things. At geography, you know, certainly we're looking at the world and, and all the various sciences, certainly the life sciences. And so we're looking at these lessons, not just, yes, we want to teach about conservation, but really we want the teachers to be able to use conservation-based learning for all of these other subjects. And again, it's fun. It's, it, it turns out to be <laughs> fun to do these things. And what could otherwise be very dry, but you know, put on a detective hat and it becomes fun. Right. But, but I, and, I, and, and how wonderful then for teachers and for parents uh, to have the kind of cross-fertilization 
um, that you're describing between one uh, subject matter domain and another. Because um, these uh, topic of conservation, rainforest, palm oil, um, they touch upon, as you said, you know, geography, so many other areas. Uh, and, and so what a, what a rich uh, gift uh, to provide in your curriculum uh, for teachers who are, of course, always under pressure to include STEM and STEAM and everything. And this enables um, a fun way to learn everything from detective work to activism and advocacy to some geography and some math and chemistry as well. <laughs> so it's a win, 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 win. <laughs> in every direction. And as a writer, uh, as, you know, there's so much, I, I actually saw um, a, a classroom that integrated it with vocabulary. They had the huge vocabulary sheets that they all became experts in. There's a whole thing about persuasive and expository writing. So it, yeah, it, it really does connect across all the disciplines. Yes, what fun. <laughs> well, um, it's clear that the case of the disappearing habitat, the candy culprit um, has been received pretty well. I take it as you're describing how much fun kids say they're having. And I have to imagine that teachers are loving it as well. Have you gotten much feedback from teachers? Yeah, it's, it's the thing that's, um, <clears throat> the thing that's really nice for teachers, especially right now, is they're being asked to, del teaching is a hard job. <laughs> it's a really, yeah. really hard oh, job. Yeah. Um, I think everybody should have to be a teacher for at least, I think everybody should have to wait tables, everybody should have to, to do food service, and everybody should have to teach for at least a week just to feel right. that's a, that the we, we pressure. have a better society. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, but right now, teachers are being asked not only to just do their regular, very, very challenging job, but to also do it online, hybrid, and wearing a mask. And ensuring that their children who are in the classroom with them are wearing masks and to also teach online to children who are at home. It's, it's, it's bananas. It's really very challenging. Oh, so it's the thing, massive. It's a yeah. massive challenge. So, so yeah, the absolutely. thing that's been very um, rewarding about seeing teachers be able to use this content is it works perfectly for that exact challenge because absolutely. you can connect it's the online component of it is there for people at home. It's there for people in the classroom and you can connect with each other at home and um, in the classroom. Yeah. Okay. And um, so it allows that, that to work. So we've gotten really positive feedback from teachers about how, how easy it is to use and how scaffolded it is. Um, I'm not surprised to hear that. And the materials are just so visually appealing as well as so rich in terms of the content. I'm not surprised to hear that you're getting that kind of feedback from uh, the teachers and the students and homeschoolers, I, I'm sure also yeah. must be giving, uh, uh, you know, praying for you every day <laughs> in well, gratitude. So, <laughs> well, so now I need to find out um, the case of the candy, uh, the case of disappearing hat, the candy culprit has been launched. Are you waking on more um, cases in need of student smoothing? What's in the works? So we definitely have something because you know, candy, candy is only one piece of the disappearing habitat, but it's it's still top secret. <laughs> <laughs> as top secret. Candy is. <laughs> There's more to the world. <laughs> I'd also like to mention that um, the Brockton Cable Channel has been running the video series, the case of the disappearing habitat vi video series, on their station. They've run it over a hundred times, so clearly it's being well received. The Brockton Public Library has been kind enough to allow Laura to do a session. And that I was able to sit in on that session. And I have to tell you, the kids, I mean, Laura's great. The kids just blew me away. Awesome. That, that was so much fun. So, and we're also, Mary, we're also modifying, as I mentioned, the lessons that we currently have. So there's one, for example, that for a long time we called, I suppose very boringly, conservation statuses, what do they mean? And I went in after learning what I've learned from Laura about project-based um, uh, lessons and STEM and STEAM standards and all of that. I went in and redid the video and it's now called the Alphabet Soup of Conservation. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> because <laughs> conservation is full of acronyms. And what on earth do all of these acronyms mean? 
And, and, so, and what's important about conservation status is, is that it tells you about how dire the need is with 23,000 species that are endangered. You know, this, this tells you, and then you, there's something you can do about it because as you learn about the conservation statuses and you understand what the threats are, you can make choices. We also have life in the world's tropical rainforest, which Laura used within the candy culprit. Those are the tiles she's talking about. We set it up as a game. We set it up as a matching game to teach kids about the different primates and their, you know, and, and where what the rainforest that they live in. And Laura has used that in her lesson. And we're also going to add these additional STEM, STEAM steps to that lesson rather than it just being a game. And we also have primates in their habitats, which is a card game. And we're going to add to that as well. And then, we, and then we have another one that I can tell you about. We have another um, educator. She's a, a college educator, but she's doing a great job working with, you know, developing this for younger kids. And it's called Your Evolutionary Family Tree. So mm -hmm. it's all about evolution. And again, we've made it fun. It's been challenging to take this topic and make it fun. But we have, and kids will learn how to build Venn diagrams. Again, not very interesting. We've made that fun. And they'll also build a phylogenetic tree, which is also called the tree of life, mm -hmm. among primates mm -hmm. so that they can see how similar we are, how different we are, and that we all have our place here. That there's a very, very we have the same evolutionary history, and we all play an important role on this planet. So those are some of the things that we've got in the works. Well, they just sound wonderful, the way you're transforming things that are really important for people to learn about, especially children. Um, but in, instead of making them sound difficult and off-putting, you're making them sound exciting and inviting. Um, and so um, that just sounds really wonderful. Thank you for the work you're doing. Um, it just sounds transformative. Um, uh, so on behalf of the planet and future generations, much gratitude. <laughs> so uh, I would like to find out then from each of you, since you work on these issues and, and the realities are hard, uh, uh, you know, and it's great that you're uh, working on, um, you know, transforming children into activists and, and advocates, but I'd like to find out from what, do, what makes each of you feel hopeful these days? Um. We've talked about this before, you know, there was a time that you never heard too much about animals. People didn't talk that much about animals. They were peripheral to everything. They, you know, we didn't treat them as, I'm going to say equals. And um, what we know now is that people are really paying attention to conservation and animal protection issues. People understand that animals are thinking and feeling beings. They understand that their companion animals, whether they're cats, their dogs, their hamsters, their horses, their sheep, that they're family members. Yeah. And they, they understand that they have their own families as well, that they don't have to be part of the human family. And this is very important. You know, it, it's not so much this um, egocentric, egocentric view of humanity. We understand that we share the planet with others. Every news program that you see now includes something about animals. That wasn't true 15, 20 years ago. But now I defy you to find me a news program that doesn't tell you something about animals. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I thought I turned this off. Uh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's part of the Zoom world. <laughs> I, I thought I did. I, actually, I like it when people's cats walk by in the background or their phones go off. It's very humanizing. <laughs> <laughs> I just find that rude. Anyhow, the other, the, other, the, the other thing that makes me hopeful, as I mentioned, is the kids. Wow. Kids make me so hopeful. They're hungry for information. They're hungry for knowledge. They want to know what can they do better than what we've done. And if we can gift them with some information that we've learned, especially as we get older and we learn all of the mistakes of the past, if we can gift them with some kernels of information about here's what we've learned, here are the mistakes. You don't have to make those mistakes. Let's do this better 
for the planet overall. And something else that makes me hopeful is our volunteers. These are people who have so much passion for this topic. They're incredibly talented. They give us so much of their time and they do it so freely and willingly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it blows my mind, Mary. Sometimes it just <laughs> blows my mind that we have these talented, incredible people who are willing to put it so much of themselves into this because they believe in it. And like Laura, they didn't know where their outlet was before. What else can I do? And sometimes I think, how, I, I like, I have to like walk away and say, am I really this lucky you know, that, I've got, <laughs> that I've got all of these people and what more can I do for them? Because, and, and, and as Laura always tells me, the reward is in the doing. And I know that for myself. I know that in having founded New England Primate Conservancy, that's the case for me. The reward is in the doing. But man, oh man, I mean, these people are just phenomenal. And how did I get so lucky? Well, that's inspiring to hear. And, and I think, you know, that um, there are a few things in life more gratifying than feeling like you're part of something larger than yourself and noble. Um, and that you are expanding that, that nobility outward into the world. So, but those are great things that you feel hopeful about. How about you, Laura? So I, sometimes I, I struggle a lot with, uh, sometimes um, my, like all good detectives, I got a lot of demons. <laughs> um, and sometimes, Most detectives do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing that um, I think that hope, I find hope just in the fact that I want to do better. Yeah. And when you feel like I want to do better and I can do something, anything that builds hope. So to me, hope is, hope is the choice to, to try and do better. And I think that anytime I see anyone who wants to do better, that gives me hope. So it's a, those are the things that build upon each other. And I do think that when we actually do anything that help, that is in the direction of what we hope to see other people do, we become very empowered and we become more strong and we become more able to give other people hope. Well, that, that's really well put. And I like the idea implicit in what you're saying that hope is self-renewing, literally self-renewing and self-generating. And with each decision that you make to take an action that creates more hope. Um, or as I think it was Thich Nhat Hanh who said, be the change that you wanna see in the world. Um, so thank you both for that. You've made me feel more hopeful. I feel better already. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the, the, the last and very important thing that I wanna ask you is how can people learn more about the New England Primate Conservancy and your work and and if people are feeling the need for generating their own help by becoming active, um, what kinds of things do you need volunteers for these days? Well, first of all, if they wanna know more about us, go to our website, it's neprimateconservancy.org. It's a 428-ish page website <laughs> and, and everything in it is layered. So one thing brings you to the next, depending upon what direction you wanna go in, but there's tons of information in there. We would love it if there were more educators who would like to join us, especially if they're familiar with uh, standards-based education and STEAM and STEM education. We need them both to help us continue modifying our existing lessons and developing new lessons. Um, I would be interested in talking to graphic designers or people who are graphic artists or illustrators, people who know how to create um, illustrative videos those are, those are the types of the things that I think that, you know, would expand our programs further. And if there are talented and creative people out there who have other ideas, maybe things that haven't occurred to us yet or things that we haven't yet been able to tackle, I'd be interested in talking to them about it. Mm -hmm. And of course, as all nonprofits will tell you, and I can't leave without saying this, we always need financial assistance. Yes. We, we don't know how the pandemic is going to impact our 2021 grants. And as you know, we offer everything free of charge. So um, we will absolutely, we always need the support of the public, 
but we don't know how the Im what the impact is going to be financially next year. So more than ever, we need the public support. Mm -hmm. So loss of opportunities for people in many ways. Um, and I would add also having visited your website, it's visually stunning. So people will enjoy the visit. <laughs> uh, um, no matter what else you're, you're looking for, look at the primate profiles. <laughs> oh, and I just, just gorgeous. <laughs> and I just you want to add. Support. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to add something. If you are a teacher or an educator and you want to use the candy culprit, you want, or if the local library there wants a presentation for an after school uh, virtual event or anyone in the local school system wants to use this content and needs help adapting it or needs wants any sort of support, I'm here to do that. Well, thank you for adding that. That's really important and what a wonderful opportunity. Thank you both, Deborah and Laura, for coming to the morning show. You both speak with such conviction and such clarity. Um, I, I'm not at all surprised that children are loving this curriculum because you have a way of making it engaging and fun and exciting and last but not least, hopeful. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. It's such, such, a, such important work you do. And once again, thank you both for the contributions that you're making on you know, saving the planet and helping the next generation. So thanks a lot for visiting the morning show. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you for so much. That's it for today, everybody. Thanks for watching The Morning Show. I hope you'll join us next Thursday at 9 a.m. when Annika Terena of the World Wildlife Fund will be visiting to help us understand the link between public health and the health of the natural world. You know, my attention was drawn to this subject by an article in the fall 2020 issue of World Wildlife Magazine with the attention-grabbing title, Sealing Pandora's Box, Protecting Nature to Help Stop the next pandemic before it starts. Well, that got my attention and it probably got yours as well. We're all suffering from pandemic fatigue. So um, anything we can learn that will help us prevent having another is all to the good. I hope you'll join us next week and to learn uh, about what zoonotic diseases are and what we can do to stop their spread and thereby prevent future pandemics. Wouldn't that be great? So if you missed part of today's show, it will be available for viewing on Port Media's YouTube channel playlist for the morning show. Go to www.ncmhub.org and just click on the YouTube icon. Each show will also air on WJOP FM 96.3 on Friday at 8 a.m. And then again the following Tuesday at 4 p.m. and Wednesday at 3 p.m. And will also be available as a podcast on the SoundCloud. Just click on the cloud icon at www.ncmcom.org and then scroll down. That's it for today, everybody. See you back next week at nine on Channel Nine. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Deborah. Bye, Laura. Take Bye. care. Thanks again. Bye -bye. I think we're done. It says it's still recording. Yeah.